And good morning. It is a bright uh, Wednesday morning. I almost said Monday. And I don't know about you, Ryan, but I sent you that text this morning because it's Wednesday, but it feels like Tuesday because we missed a day. And so I thought I better just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I hope you had a good Memorial Day. I hope you took time, one, to honor the men and women who gave us our freedoms. Well, no, let me correct myself. Didn't give us our liberties or our freedoms, but they protect those liberties and freedoms here in America. I hope you took time to honor them. I also hope you took time to honor family members. Um, we decorate the graves in our family. I know not everybody does that, but it's something that I take a, a day off. It takes literally a day to go to all the cemeteries that we go to. And you would think it might be a little bit um, depressive or uh, um, in some way... Uh, um, not everyone's comfortable in a cemetery, and it's not that it's my favorite place to go, but it actually ends up being a wonderful day as I think back over my heritage, my Christian heritage, my family's legacy. I am very blessed to have good, loving parents and grandparents and people who nurtured me and cared for me. And so for me, it's a great day of reminiscing and giving thanks, having a grateful heart for all those good memories that I do have, and praying over my next generation, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren yet to come, and carrying on the legacy that was started in my family. So I hope you get time to do that as well, or that you took time to do that as well. We're going to jump right into things today. We have a full slate. Every every week I am I'm impressed. Sometimes I'm a little nervous up to Tuesday when things are still being confirmed, but uh, we've had these guests on the docket for a while, uh, Dr. Peg Luxick will be joining us. If you recognize that name, she is one of the leaders in the battle on Common Core. She'll be talking about computer adaptive test and modifying behavior in children without you ever knowing about it. Think this through. Most parents won't even know what questions, what, what's being said to their kids. And we'll talk about that more later. But And, and then at the end of the show, t- uh, 1045, Scott Hagerstrom is going to join us. He is out of Detroit with Americans for Prosperity, out of Michigan, I should say. I don't know if he comes from Detroit, but we'll be talking about the demise of Detroit and the fact that politicians are once again plundering the taxpayers to pay for their poor policies. So we'll be talking about the bailout in Detroit at 1045 with Americans for Prosperity, Scott Hagerstrom. First, we're going to jump to a friend we've had on this show before, another leader in the Common Core or Stopping Common Core battle. Uh, Alice Linehan is joining me. You can find Alice online. You can do a search for her on either Voices in Power, Women on the Wall, uh, Can I See. She has several programs and and, um, areas where she's active and working, but we're going to join Alice right now. Alice, thank you. Uh, very much for joining us today on uh, Truth for Our Time with Tamara Scott. Oh, thank you for having me. It's an honor. I want to jump in right now. You are having an event in Dallas, and I put on my little note that I sent out to some folks that, um, and if folks, if you want to be on that list, if you want updates of the show, just email me, uh, truthforourtime at gmail.com, truthforourtime at gmail.com, and just say, put me on your mailing list. But you are going up against the PTA, you're doing a, a conference the same time in Dallas. And let me correct you. Actually, the conference is in Austin, Texas. Oh, I'm glad you corrected me. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. And the National PTA Association announced that they're having their first time ever to have their national conference in Texas, and it will be in Austin, Texas, a state, by the way, that said no to the Common Core standards. And um, it's interesting who they're bringing in as their keynote speaker, um, Arne Duncan, who, along with the National PTA Association, are cheerleaders for the Common Core. So it's interesting that they would come into Texas um, to have their national convention. And when you start looking at their comp- their convention and the different sessions that they have planned for their convention, it's all about bringing the Common Core into um, our, our local communities. And what's even more uh, alarming is that they are using the PTA 
those everyday moms and dads who are involved at the local level doing donuts with dad and and fundraisers for their local school, they're using them to get them to buy into the idea that their children's personal data should be collected in the name of education research. Um, They're featuring one of their sessions is um, Breaking New Ground, Data Systems Transform Family Engagement in Education. Um, As Meryl Hope says in her Breitbart article, um, it helps bring mom and dad on board with the value of data collection of their children. So the the National PTA Association, um, we decided if they're going to bring this into Texas, Um, Texans are going to say no, and we are holding a counter conference across the street from theirs, and um, we are bringing in the the best of the best, the the names that you are starting to hear um, as commonplace in the anti-Common Core movement. Um, We we have Dr. Peg Luxick, uh, who will be coming in to to explain a lot of this. We have... um, Dr. Sandra Stotsky, we have Dr. James Milgram, um, we have Jane Robbins with the American Principles Project. So we will have all of these voices across the street so that moms and dads can hear the truth um, about what's really happening in education. And so our conference is June 20th and 21st. And we've got some um, incredible people lined up, but we've got some unique things that we won't be announcing today, but I encourage everyone to watch as this conference um, develops because we've got some really exciting things that's gonna ha- that are going to happen where people all across the country, these mo- everyday moms and dads, will have access to what happens at this conference um, in June. And so give us, our listeners and our viewers, the website where they can best find the information on your conference or where they can, in fact, register. They can go to womenonthewall.org and um, and register online there. We also, um, not today, but um, in the next day, we will have just the Can I See, you can go to Can I See, C A N I S E E dot org um, to also register. But for now, go to womenonthewall.org. And I, I want to let people know the idea behind Can I See? We've talked about it on your show before. Um, we're not going to elect people to fix this for us, I don't believe. It's going to be everyday moms and dads. And taxpayers who go in and say, can I see what you're teaching my child? Can I see how you're teacher, teaching my child? What is the professional development of the teachers and the educators? And can I see who's financially benefiting from the curriculum products that my child's teacher is being evaluated on? And so this, the name of this conference is Can I See the Solution? Um, because we're going to be providing solutions, um, information about piloted and proven successful curriculums that are are out there that aren't aligned with the Common Core. And so we know that even though your state did not take the Common Core originally, uh, I have an article in front of me from Breitbart, you have change agents operating within Texas trying to bring it into the state anyway. And you wouldn't believe it, but I know some of these change agents. I actually went to school with them. <laughs> they are not they they're not the change agents that you think of. They're not radical people. They're everyday teachers who have gone to training and professional development and and I had a very close friend of mine who actually described herself as a change agent in the classroom. She is a strong Christian conservative woman, woman, but she has bought into the idea behind 21st century learning and outcome-based education. 
So that's what we need to understand, that these change agents aren't our enemy necessarily, that it's about educating people. And that's why Dr. Peg Luxick is so critical to this conversation, because she can clearly articulate what has been happening and what this is and what the end goal is of those people. A lot of people have been deceived. And, um, so, so when you think of those change agents, think of your your friends, your neighbors, people you went to school with. All right. Um, well, Alice, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you popping in just for ten minutes. If they want more information, listeners, viewers, go to womenonthewall.org, where you can register for that conference now, June twentieth and twenty first. What a great way to get away for a couple of days and get great information. If you can make it to Austin, Texas, Austin, not Dallas. Also, can I see? You'll be able to get information there at, uh, very soon. Can I see? You can always hashtag can I see on Twitter and follow Alice Linehan there, L I N A H A N. We want to um, move forward, and I hate that because there's always so much more we could talk about when we're battling the Common Core. It just never, ever can fit in one program. But we want to move forward. Dr. Peg Luxick is here with us today, and I'm so honored to have her on the show, and I know many of you are excited about that. And, of course, of all days, my email shut down, and I couldn't send out my own um, promotions on the show. It just really fried me, if you want to know the truth. So I tried to send out Twitters and get on the Facebook pages that are out there today and stopping Common Core. Dr. Peg Luxick, I am so pleased she can join us. Let me just run through her bio real quickly, if I can, and I'll put it in bullet points because there's just so much information there. This woman has been a leader for some time doing great things. Um, She has, for the past 30 years, worked to defend life and liberty. She's helped homeschoolers in Pennsylvania pass laws they needed to educate their own children. She sat on the founding boards of the Pennsylvania Family Institute and the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. She's founded an alternative to abortion service organization called Mom's House. She's worked in as an advisor to President Reagan's Commission on the Family. She created the National Parents Commission to fight for parental rights and education. And she's hosted her own television show, like me, called The Learning Curve on the National Empowerment Television Network created by Free Congress Foundation. And like me, she has her first grandbaby. And so I, I, I already feel um, like I know Dr. Peg Luxick. I watched several of her videos. I've been stalking her, I guess, learning information as I watch her on YouTube. And you can find her, too. We'll put some of those links up on the chat line here at webcastonelive.com. Dr. Luxick, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. What I want to do first, and I hope this is okay with you, I want to go to that uh, video on YouTube. Brian, if you'll start at about 118, where Dr. Lessig is explaining the um, computer adaptive test. The problem isn't that it's self-paced. The problem is that the test is open to manipulation. So if I want it to look like the students are doing poorly, Mm -hmm. I can adapt it to make the test harder. If I want it to look like the students are doing well, it can be adapted to make the test easier. And you as parents or taxpayers or policy setters will never know which way the test was adapted because it's an internal mechanism. So it is not a valid assessment. And the, that, that is the fundamental problem with it is that the test is being manipulated as it's being taken. Okay, In- okay Ryan, thank you, Ryan. Let's hold it right there. All right, Dr. Luxick. We've, we've already heard this. We've been told what a great way this was. So if a student's doing well, they can go on. They get different questions. If a student's having trouble, then they get a different set of questions. And I knew in my gut I didn't like it. I had a hindrance with it because you'd never know what a student was getting or not. I'm so thankful for someone like you who can confirm those fears that I had. Yes. You know, it's, there's a number of layers of this that make it difficult. Um, first is, the states tell folks that the tests are both valid and reliable. They're not. Valid, those are actually defined words in the world of testing, whether it's educational testing or medical testing or product uh, testing, you know, for testing if a product works or not. Valid means, first of all, that everybody takes the same test under the same conditions. So, because otherwise, how do you know whether the results match? So the, the first problem with this is everybody's taking a different test, so nobody knows whether it's working or not. You don't know if your child is taking the same test as the child sitting beside them, which 
in effect makes the results meaningless for you as a parent or for the teacher or a taxpayer or a legislator because they have no idea what test the child actually took. Okay. However, the people running the computer program know exactly what test the child took. So would they share that with us? They know. And that's part of what happens in this picture. You really, the test over and over and over again, we're hearing they are cloaked in secrecy. Parents are being told they can't see the test even after the test has been administered. The, in Utah, the test is called the SAGE test, S-A-G-E. And children are walking out reporting dizziness, disorientation, nausea. Parents are saying their children are hostile after they take the test. None of those are normal uh, after effects of standardized testing. Sometimes before a child starts the test, right. they have a few butterflies in their sure. stomach. But when you're done, you shouldn't be experiencing disorientation or dizziness or nausea, nor should there be an emotional behavior change. Okay. Children who are interviewed from the test are telling are telling interviewers, and it's available on YouTube, they're telling interviewers that the test has different colors, the colors seem to pulse, they can't really figure out why the colors are doing what they're doing. Those are all very dangerous manipulation techniques and should never be used on children. So when we have children giving us emotional, inappropriate emotional responses to testing and then reporting that the testing has disturbing elements within it, parents should be more concerned than ever and should be insisting that those tests be made available, as should legislators. All right. So there are already like three different questions I've written down here, so I'll try and peel them back. There's just so much here. Um, first off, we had John Epilato, Epilito, if I'm saying his name correctly, last week on this show. He's a father who just simply tried to get his kids' records, the data collection that they start in preschool. He just wanted to know what you're saying about my own children. Four children, they told him no unless he paid $10,000. So you're right. Yeah. This information is not available to parents. The other question I have for you then is a couple. And um, so if the standards, we're hearing that we have to have these standards so that if we have kids in the military, kids moving, they all get taught the same thing and won't have gaps. But as you're saying, unless the test is the same, you can't test the same product or same progress. Right. So, that's, so it's an internal contradiction. At one level, they're saying, well, no, we have to know that every child's the same, which, of course, is structurally impossible because children aren't. But at another level, they're openly saying, and um, states in their, uh, when they apply for flexibility for No Child Left Behind, they're telling the federal government openly that, yes, we're using the computer adaptive test. The PARC test is a computer adaptive test. The um, SBAC test, the Smarter Balance test, they're saying their test is moving to computer adaptive. It changes with the child. Now, there's several issues with that, other than the fact that it is, is it makes the results not valid for any outside person looking at it. The second issue is, well, what kind of questions are you asking? Because we are hearing, and if you read the documents, well, questions are, are short answers. We want critical thinking. We want them to give opinions if I control the test and you can't move forward until you give me the answer that I want, or I can adapt the test to continue to move you through a circle until you give me the answer that I want, are the tests themselves part of the behavior modification package? Okay. To understand how assessment works, the, the easiest example is a telemarketer. I know that sounds funny, but it's it actually is a perfect example. So a telemarketer calls you and says, hi, I'm selling purple shoes. And you say, okay. And then the telemarketer says, do you like the color purple? And you say yes or no. Do you wear shoes? And you say yes or no. Are you the chief purchaser of shoes for your family? That's a pretest. I, as the telemarketer, now know several things about you so that I can make my sales pitch, the curriculum, adapt to what you've told me. So based on what you've told me, I use a particular sales pitch, and when I'm done, I say, should I put that on your Visa or your MasterCard? That's the assessment. I am testing you. If you pick Visa or MasterCard, you may move forward 
this conversation will end. I'll take your information and we'll go, you can go on with your life and I'll go on with mine. If you say no, oh, well, then you didn't pass the assessment. So I'm going to say, what is your objection? And you're going to tell me. That's, I'm doing an analysis. Why didn't you pass my test? So I'm going to ask a few questions to get you to tell me why you didn't pass the test. And then I'm going to answer what you said. That's remediation. I'm teaching you again so that you can get it correct. And when I'm done, I say, so shall I put that on your visa or your MasterCard? If you pick one, congratulations. You have passed the reassessment because I assessed you again now. Second time, Visa or MasterCard, if you correctly answer, you've passed the reassessment, you can move on with your life. If you do not, what is your objection? And I will reevaluate and remediate you again. Now, most of us are polite, so we let the telemarketer go through two times and then say, you know, I'm really not interested. Thank you very much. But in these tasks, a child in a classroom can't get up and walk away. Right. Nor, they can't hang up the phone. Nor do they know enough to do so or that they're being manipulated when they are. And if they were just teaching kids 2 plus 2 is 4 and reinforcing it, we'd be thrilled. But they're not. And that's what we're going to talk about. We have to take a break right here. And I want to, of course, give our sponsors due time. We're thankful for Crave uh, Ministries who's come alongside us, uh, uh, Citizens Reviving American Values. We're thankful for them, and we're also thankful for Webcast One, uh, uh, WebcastOneLive.com, which is the studio in which we are powered by when we do Tamara Scott Live with Truth For Our Time. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. There's much more information that you really need to know, and I've got more questions for Dr. Luxick. I want to come back to this dizziness and nauseaness because, nauseation because I think there's more here that might be given to our kids that we won't know because kids seldom tell you what they fear most or what they find most distressing. They just don't verbalize it. So we'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit! You're our hero! And I am Tamara Scott. You are listening slash watching uh, Tamara Scott Live with Truth For Our Time. For those of you who are watching on Webcast One Live, we thank you. If you want to send this to a friend afterward, you may send the podcast. You can find all podcasts and archives of the show, Tamara Scott Live, on YouTube. They're accessible for you. Use them however you find helpful. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Peg Luxick, L-U-K-S-I-K, L-U-K-S-I-K. You can find her at Founded in Truth. I believe it, it's .com, correct, Peg? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. 
truth, founditintruth.com. You were talking about how these tests could change behavior because they're implying things for children who are very leadable, who are very um, amicable and willing to follow. And I just did a tweet a couple, I think a week ago, um, that the school had ask kids to imagine and then draw what was on their mind. So they invade this eight-year-old's mind, and then they don't like what they find, so they punished him with a mark on bad behavior. And my point was, first off, they should have never been there, but two, if they're going to ask for that, then they put this mark of behavior on his, on his record now with the whole P20W data collection following children well into the workplace. Will he lose potential scholarships? Will that stay on his record permanently? Because we know juveniles in delinquent halls get things expunged, but the records in Common Core and on the school children are permanent. And will he be able to find a job when employers now have liability issues and often can't fire, hire someone who has possibly shown some type of liking or even people consider guns an act of violence. I don't. I consider it an act of defense. To a citizen, it's a symbol of security and defense. To a criminal, it's a symbol of violence. But anyway, I want to come back, Peg. The, these, these tests um, are changing behavior. That's the whole purpose of them. And our kids won't tell us. They won't come home and say, Mom, I felt really manipulated or mom, then they showed this screen and this pulsing light did this. They can't often put it into words, but what you're talking about there, when I heard that early on they had seats that measured something, body temperature, bracelets that measured pulse, the iris scan, you know, they're measuring all the biometric impulses of our children. Is there a possibility in these tests that they're putting images up to see if a child will be honest, if a child relates or reacts to violence are, are there other things or testing that we have should be greatly concerned about but we can't find the truth out well the problem is we don't know the answer to that question and the fact that someone even needs to ask it is a grave concern we don't know here's what we do know we do know for example that the ged test has been this year adapted to Common Core, and we've seen some of the uh, sample questions and the way that they're constructed. So there's a, the way the GED test works now, the children are given a source text, something to read, then they're given a writing prompt, and the children are told you are graded on the complexity of your answers. How well do you use facts and figures and data? How well do you use the information in the source text to um, justify your answer? The source text on global warming, first of all, says the temperatures are increasing and then attributes it to human industrial activity and population growth. All of the information in the source text only comes from that political point of view. No information is given from any other point of view on the issue of climate change. So the child is sitting in this testing situation. They are given all of this information. Problem one, when children are in a testing situation, their screens are not up, meaning any data that is presented as part of a question just goes in without being evaluated by the child. Whereas if it was presented, you know, in a lecture or in a homework assignment with a mom standing there, they might ask a question. But in the test, they're focusing on, I want to do well in this test, so they just swallow the information, which means... The way that the information is presented is way more likely to get past any internal screen that the child has. So that's problem one. Problem two, suppose a child actually keeps his screen up and says, well, wait a minute, this is, I don't agree with this information on global warming. I don't think, I don't, climate temperatures um, are not, in fact, increasing. And human industrial activity and population growth, well, you know, there's a lot of evidence on, on a lot of other theories about that its situation. So I don't accept the premise, but the answer is you are graded on the complexity of your response. Well, then the child had better know all the facts and figures for an opposing political point of view out of his head, which he probably doesn't. So the child who does not subscribe to the political point of view of the source text is taking a harder examination, meaning on average, he will get a lower score. You know, if I give you all the answers from one point of view, but none of the answers from another one, 
then you're taking a harder test. But the GED test determines if you graduate from high school, and your score determines do you go to college and what college do you get into? Do you get a scholarship and how big will it be? The GED test, and this is the publicly um, available information, is not we're being told it's a writing test. In fact, it's sorting children based on their political beliefs with children who did not subscribe getting a lower score. Well, now, that's a huge issue that parents wouldn't know because you don't get to see the source text. Similarly, the new AP um, U.S. history course, the College Board has just announced that they've made it available, and they now have a 98-page uh, framework, and it includes the topics that are going to be presented and the sample uh, sample test. These are the kind of questions we're going to be asking. So I read it. Well, when you read the history, what is striking is that the only time George Washington is mentioned is a reference to his farewell address when he talks about guarding against political parties. World War II is one half of one page. There's no reference to Hitler or why we were there. And when you read through all of the um, content standards, the things that these are the, what the teacher is supposed to teach, it, it's all about how America was uh, racially segregated and whites thought they were superior and the Native Americans were mistreated. And it's a, it's a very skewed view. There's no conversation about the fact that, yes, America had slavery and that was terrible, but so did people in the rest of the world. No, that's not referenced. In one of the um, training sessions, a teacher stood when being presented with this said, well, wait a minute, you only present white on black slavery. There is black on black slavery. Like slavery was a worldwide problem. And the response of the facilitator was, well, we don't want to confuse the children with that information. We don't want to confuse the children with fact. Then you get to the, the sample test and the children are supposed to read and give you, um, I think it's four different little source texts, and then you have to write from it. All of it, all of the source texts deal with slavery and that, that the whole concept that white people are, are basically racist and black people have, have this whole country has been a history of enslavement. It's, it's a very dark and skewed picture um, of American history, whether you're talking about uh, African American, Native American, women, this, there's, there's, you wouldn't like America when you were done. And the way that the test is constructed is to reinforce the uh, philosophy that's been promoted through the course. Again, kids in an AP kit course, they want to pass. So they're going to swallow everything you give them because they want to pass. And the test, is presenting information, which it is not that the information is not accurately, like if they say so-and-so said it, so-and-so did say it, but there's never a counterbalance to this was one position, but there were other people who had other positions. Right. There's never a counterbalance to it. There's only ever one very hostile to America position. It's it's a, a very dark and negative picture of American history, and it, it uh, course syllabus begins by saying that the students don't have to learn anything, will not be tested on anything that is not in this syllabus, which give, means the syllabus is total control. Now, state boards of education have put together what they want in American history, and we have local school boards talking about it. We have state laws that say kids need to learn the history of their state. They need to learn civics. The college board is in unelected nonprofit organization headed by David Coleman, who was the architect of the Common Core Standards. And the college board controls the AP exams, so they are unilaterally revamping the AP exams, putting a curriculum together to match their new philosophy, and then force-feeding it to every school across the country, the brightest children, because AP classes are your brightest children. So the same philosophy that gave us Common Core, he's now the head of the college board, 
and using the AP courses and the AP exams to direct curriculum, making it end around state boards of education, and, state and, legislatures, local school boards. And we've seen this coming for a while with the indoctrination at the college level. But I want to come back. Ryan, if you want to play 440 on that video where Dr. Lexick is talking about the, the question on finding the wallet. I was reading the assessments, and it was a reading assessment. And it was a story about a child who found a wallet, and there was money in the wallet, and what do you do with the money? I'm sitting in the Department of Education, reading it in front of the undersecretary, because they didn't want me to make a copy and take it anywhere, which was fine. Um, and the question was to the child, if you found a wallet, a wallet with money in it, would you take it? Do you read better if you say yes? Or do you read better if you say no? Or were they testing a child's honesty on a state assessment with their name on it that was computerized? All right, Ryan. Right. paper and pencil, I Thank you. Dr. Luxick, I love the fact that she, right there, yes or no, which student makes a better reader? And I was reading, I was telling my husband about this, who's an attorney, and he said, well, first off, it's an incomplete question because the student very well may take it, and I guess I, I should listen better. I don't know if it said, do you keep it? But if a student may take it, they may take it to the office. They may take it to the lost and found. So they could answer yes, and it would be a wrong answer. Exactly. It, it, the, the questions, um, they're not always very well worded. <laughs> but the intent was not to test a reading level. It was interesting when I actually turned the paper around and asked the people in the Department of Education, what's the right answer? And... Do you read better if you say yes, or do you read better if you say no? It created quite a bit of consternation in the building that day because they really weren't expecting anyone to challenge it. And frankly, children wouldn't challenge it. This is a reading test. To what grade They're level? Not going to answer the question. That was uh, eighth grade. They're just going to answer the question, eighth or ninth, because some schools divided eighth and some schools divided ninth. But it was, you know, like it would be a junior high test. So they. Um, Kids just answer the questions. When they're involved in a testing situation, they're just going to answer the questions. And go so, on, if you will, to the to the Midnight Marauders. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm pushing you because we only have so much time and there's so much I want to ask you. But the Midnight Marauders, where they, they don't give an option that should be there. Right. They don't. The, the, that was a, um, it was called the Educational Quality Assessment in Pennsylvania. It was given... Oh, back I begin in the late 60s, I think it began and it went all the way up through the 70s. Um, it surfaced because a child came home and said to his mom, I took the weirdest test today, and he started to describe it, and she went in and said, show me the test, and was told it was a secret, and wound up suing them. She went all the way to Washington and won. Um, Is that so Anita, test, Anita Hogue? Is that Anita who? Hogue, Okay. Yes. okay. Um, the test was made, it's not made public as too big, but she got it, and, and through her, I got it. It was called citizenship, and if a parent heard citizenship, you would think they would be asking how many people are in the House of Representatives and how long is your senator elected for. But the, the documents from the state themselves said, we're not asking any of that information. We're not asking objective information. We are testing for, they said, um, adaptability. There were se several things. There was thresholds for behavior change. What would it take to make you do whatever? And then we are testing for how adaptable the child is to change without protest. So they would be asked questions, would you become the midnight murders of vandalism? Would you do it if, would you do it if, and all of these had a different, uh, like my best friends were in the group, I was sure I wouldn't get caught. There was never an option to say, I won't do it. In the behavior, accepting change without protest was your, the one sample was my family's my father just found out he got a job, you know, in another state and my family's moving. How much time would you spend on each of the following things? Crying, being upset, um, saying goodbye to my friends, packing. There were like some things that were, yes, I'll just accept the change and other things that were, no, I will not accept the change. But they were testing the children in, for their attitudes and how they viewed life and how they responded. Each school district then, when they got their EQA scores back, they were then also given um, packets to adapt their curriculum so that the children would do better on the test the next time. 
but the test wasn't academic. The test was attitudinal and behavioral. So that means that the curriculum that went with that test was also attitudinal and behavioral. It was an extremely ugly uh, process. Unfortunately for parents out there, that process has not changed. It's just that now the tests are paper and pencil. They're computerized tests that adapt more quickly with the child, and it's harder to get your fingers on the information because there's not a piece of paper to get. And so though those were not common core tests, we're, we're showing a, a, a behavior in the testing itself, a, a, an agenda, if you will, in the testing itself, and as you're saying, now more difficult for char- parents to expose or to find the truth about what's happening to their own children. And that's my concern when they're watching the pulse, when they're doing the, the, watching the student with the camera, with the, with the chairs that measures whatever the chair measures. Are they, what are they watching for a, ch- a child? If a child doesn't flinch at violence, if a child doesn't flinch when there's a lie, is I mean, it's just the possibilities there are horrific and Orwellian, if you will. Doctor, we've got to go to a break. Will you stay with us for another five minutes till, till about 1045 after the break? Okay. We'll, we'll be right back. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am Administrative Manager. I am the Senior Technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And thank you for staying tuned with us. And I do thank our sponsors. We thank Crave. We thank WebcastOneLive.com Studios. We thank you for listening in, for um, watching, for sending it to a friend, getting information out there. Dr. Peg Luxick, L-U-K-S-I-K, is my guest. You can find her at FoundedInTruth.com. FoundedInTruth.com. Several videos. Go to YouTube and do a search, and you will be um, educated and informed with any of the videos you watch 
I will post the six minute video that we've played on this show. I'll put it on the webcast one live chat so you can have that. Uh, it will also be on the Facebook page. If you go to Stop Common Core in Iowa, Stop Common Core in Iowa with the orange profile pic that says Stopping Common Core in Iowa. That is the page that I host. There is another one there that's equally great, um, but the one that I host and we'll put things on from the show is Stop Common Core in Iowa with the orange profile pic. Doctor, thank you so much for staying with us. We were talking about the testing, what they're doing with students that parents may never know because honestly, kids just don't share what scares them most. Most they, they don't scare share what is confusing to them. They just don't have the capability. And oftentimes, what I found out with my kids, they knew something was wrong and they were afraid to even share that with me. They knew it was wrong. Right. They, they thought I had okayed in my daughter's uh, sex ed class. I had gone and talked to the teacher who was a neighbor of mine, assured everything would be okay. And a year later, heard what my daughter had endured and been violated by the teaching of and the visual aids of and uh, visitors into the classroom. And she wept and she said, Mom, you went and talked and you said it would be okay. Right. You know, parents, we trust the school, we trust the teachers, and we are at home telling our children that teachers are authority figures. So it puts the child in a box when they perceive a difference. One of the things that is surfacing most immediately in these testings that are done across the, the nation, because they're doing so many field tests, the tests are too long. The test in New York, the teachers reported that the third, fourth, and fifth grade tests had the same questions, which meant they were either too easy or too hard, depending on which grade you happen to be in. Um, so children walk out with, they're basically numb and they don't do as well. And so I, sadly, as I travel, I encounter children across the country who tell me that they're dumb. One, I was, uh, one little girl, she was nine, she was adorable, and she was, um, she had come with her mom, and she decided she was my helper for the night. So she got a chair and a little glass of water and put it right beside me. She was so cute. And she's babbling away. And she was a very bright nine-year-old. And at the end, she said to me, uh, Dr. Looks like I hope you get rid of Common Core because then I won't be dumb anymore. Wow. And she said it the way you would say today's Wednesday. And I said, why, honey, you're not, you're not dumb. Why would you say that? She said, because I can't do it. My, my mom hired a tutor, and I still can't do it. The tests are designed so poorly in some cases, and in some cases so inappropriately for the age of the child being tested that the children walk out knowing that they can't do it. But little ones don't know how to evaluate an, out, an external stimulus. They internalize everything. So the only way that they can respond to a situation like that is to say, I'm dumb. And so we're, we're basically destroying the self-esteem and the self-confidence and the individual thinking abilities of our own children by placing them in testing situations that are too long, are inappropriate, that force them to confront situations that they, they cannot do developmentally. And then their response is to say, I'm not very smart. Dr. Peg Luxick has been my guest. We need to move on. I've got uh, uh, Scott Hagerstrom coming in from Americans for Prosperity out of Michigan, talking again about plundering taxpayers for the poor policies of the politicians. But I'm so thankful Dr. Peg Luxick could join us. What you're hearing is heart-wrenching. It should concern every one of you as a parent, as a grandparent, as a taxpayer, because this is tomorrow's leaders. These kids that they're ruining the self-esteem, these kids that they're destroying, these kids that they're changing, rewriting history, we'll never know what really happened in history in a decade or so if, if we continue this and allow it to happen. It must stop. I thank Dr. Peg Luxick for her work on that. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you will come back if time permits in your schedule. I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. You can get more information. Uh, founded in Truth, do a search, Dr. Peg, L-U-K-S-I-K, worth your time. Whether you have kids in the school or not, you need to understand this information and you don't want this happening to future generations. You just, as a human being in humanity, you, we just don't want to see kids treated this way. This is torturous as far as I'm concerned. Joining me now is Scott Hagerstrom. Scott is with Americans for Prosperity. And in Michigan right now, we've, well, we've heard about Detroit. It was a beautiful city. It was the city in the 50s and the, the 60s. And Scott, what happened to Detroit? 
Well, there was over 1.8 million members back or I'm sorry, uh, uh, population of 1.8 million in 1950. And I think it's really just the union culture. Uh, you know, there were 1.2 million in 1980. It dropped below a million during the 90s. And now the population stands under 700,000. They have over $18 billion in debt. Their pension system alone is $3.5 billion uh, underfunded. And uh, a lot of promises were made to a lot of people, a lot of pensioners that were relying on uh, that pension to get through, get them through their um, the, the last years of their life. And uh, they put a lot of years of service in. And uh, Detroit is sitting on over three billion dollars in assets. And uh, they have the gall to come to the Michigan taxpayers to ask for two hundred million dollars uh, when Michigan has a lot of needs. Michigan has given Detroit a lot of money. Detroit gets far and above in revenue sharing what other cities get, three times more than the average city uh, in the state of Michigan. And all we're simply saying is that the city of Detroit should have to sell some of those assets so that they can make good on those pension obligations to the retirees. What assets do they have that you're recommending they sell? Well, they have the Detroit Institute of Arts. They have one painting that could fetch as much as $200 million. They own eight, eight parking garages. They own parking lots. Uh, they own the Detroit City Airport. They own the water department. So that they have quite a few assets that they could look to and they could sell. Now, for our listeners and viewers and for me, do we want um, airports in private ownership? What, do, what are you recommending? Well, no, we're not looking to, to have private ownership. We're still having public uh, operation of the city. You have uh, uh, you have a city in Georgia. You have the city of Pontiac in Michigan that have privatized a lot of their services, reduced costs. Okay. And Pontiac, just in the past two years, they went from 57 to $36 million. And we see a lot of antics still coming from the politicians, the leadership in Detroit. And, and those, those they haven't learned their lesson, and we're enabling bad behavior. And you know what? We smaller cities, Des Moines, can learn from Detroit because our airport is doing the same thing, coming back on taxpayers where they don't even have the authority, but nobody's there to stop them. Uh, um, Just simple things, um, forcing hotels and parking garages to pay fees every time they drop a guest, a a customer off at the airport. So kind of the similar thing here. Now, you guys have a gas tax tax, uh, proposal. Again, similar to Iowa, we have people... fussing that we should raise our gas taxes because the roads are bad. You're saying it doesn't have to be A or B. It could be right. It's not a, it's not an either or choice. Michigan has the fifth highest tax on gasoline in the country. And politicians want to give us the highest tax on gasoline in the country. Uh, the budget here in Michigan has grown um, uh, 30% over the past 10 years when inflation was only 19%. So Politicians, whether it be in Michigan, and I don't know the exact uh, situation in Iowa, but the politicians need to make priorities with the dollars they already have and and make those hard decisions. They can't just keep going back to taxpayers. Uh, You know, families are trying to balance their budget, their family budget. And uh, when when politicians raise taxes, that makes it more difficult for working families to put food on the table. And it forces families to make really hard decisions. So we're just asking that politicians be more effective in how they spend their tax the tax dollars they already get. And for the listeners or viewers, Michigan is under a Republican or Democratic held Senate and House and Senate. The Republicans have a supermajority in the Senate, and they have a majority in the House. And the governor is Republican. And they're uh, wanting also. to raise your taxes. Yes, <laughs> they are. They are. I guess they, we we need to have the largest. Tax on gasoline in the country, the fifth largest, isn't isn't good enough, and uh, so uh, you know it's unfortunate when the, when certain elected officials advertise themselves as being conservative, economically conservative, fiscally conservative, and then when they go to Lansing, um, the, their vote doesn't match their rhetoric, and uh, that's sort of why Americans for Prosperity. That's one of the reasons we exist to make sure that uh, the uh, citizens back home know how their elected officials are voting in, in, in Lansing and, and, and I, you know, the capital cities and, and the states that we operate around the country. And so tell our viewers, listeners, some of the um, programs that you have. I know Americans for Prosperity is an incredible organization. I've been blessed to attend your leadership conferences the last couple of years. been blessed to watch the organization in action here in Iowa. And so what, what are you doing in Michigan to stop this tax hike? 
we, we engage in a lot of different activities from phone calls. Uh, we go door to door. We uh, visit with legislators. We do action alerts. There's lots of different things we do, uh, a lot of direct mail. And, uh, you know, we're always under assault. So we use, use a lot of different methods. And, uh, and we won't win every battle, but we do win a lot of battles. And uh, as we grow in numbers and grow in strength in Michigan and in other states around the country, uh, we have over 90,000 activists in Michigan, 2.2 million nationwide. And uh, um, it's very important as we grow in numbers, whether it be in Michigan or Iowa, uh, it, it's able to make us more effective and able to, to win more battles for limited government and economic liberty. And, of course, I'm looking at some of your articles right now, and I'm seeing at a minimum legislators can certainly trim spending in other areas, such as 21st Century Jobs Fund, and dedicate general fund revenue generated from the sales tax on gas to roads. This is exactly what we're saying in Iowa. The gas tax here is constitutionally protected, so it has to go to the road fund, which is why they justify raising it. However, you can take other revenue funds and also put them towards the roads. You do not have to raise taxes. And when I see that 21st Century Jobs Fund... I always love it when things come together on this show. Our first guest talked about the 21st century learning. These are buzz terms and phrases that someone in the government pipeline is bringing forward to get us used to the new direction they want us to go, like our second guest talked about the uh, behavior modification. They're trying to force us down a path. But but AFP has been one of the leading um, groups fighting against Common Core, which promotes the 21st century learning, and now we're talking about 21st century jobs fund. What is that in Michigan? It's basically the government picking winners and losers. Yeah. The, the last thing government should be doing. Um, you know, if you're a big business and you have a lobbyist, then you have an advantage. And that's not fair to the smaller businesses that are trying to compete in the marketplace. Well, what you do you is have, you take tax dollars from citizens and mo- force them to fund their own competition. Exactly. And it's, it's corporate welfare. Welfare, we, you know, we're opposed to welfare. And, and, and unfortunately, some people just want to beat up on welfare for um, – People that don't have the education or the means to support themselves, but then they'll turn around and they'll vote for welfare for big corporations. And uh, uh, we believe uh, smaller government, limited government, and certainly there's some people that need food stamps and a roof over their head, but but it, it can be a lot more limited. And in terms of roads, there's so many reforms. It seems like politicians, whether in Michigan or Iowa or other places, they always want to talk about more taxes. There's so many different reforms. Uh, in Michigan, we, we still have a prevailing wage, which raises the cost of road projects. We have, um, you know, we're looking at road warranties. Uh, you know, look at uh, cost-benefit analysis between concrete and asphalt. Are we getting the most bang for the buck with the dollars we're currently spending? And unfortunately, politicians always want to turn to tax increases first and not want to have to ask a lot of those hard questions. Is Michigan now a right-to-work state? You are, aren't you? We are a right-to-work state. It's something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. And it's, it's uh, December of 2012. It was passed and signed into law. And uh, it's, 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 a hu- it's a huge benefit. And uh, uh, it's one piece of the pie, though, where there's still you know, regulatory tax policy, labor policy. All the pieces have to come together uh, to have a great economy. And uh, I think in Michigan, we're, overall, we're starting to turn that corner. Um, but But... Certainly, other states are improving, too. I know states like Wisconsin and Indiana have passed a lot of tax cuts and reforms. So it's that competitive nature between the states is good because that keeps us on our game, keeps us competitive. And in the end, that raises the quality of living for everybody. For those of you who might want more information on this, you can go to americansforprosperity.org backslash Michigan. americansforprosperity.org backslash Michigan. I'll also try to post some of these on the Truth For Our Time webpage, Truth For Our Time webpage. And there are a couple more articles from, I think, the Swartz Report or the Summit Newsletter. Dr. David Noble wrote a great article on the um, Detroit that we knew in the 60s, all of the, uh, one of the wealthiest cities in the country, and then the demise because of what the unions forced in benefits and taxpayers simply couldn't keep up. The city couldn't keep up. Even those unions who demanded it, their their, um, heads of the unions moved outside of city limits because they couldn't afford the taxes, further adding to the demise. And then we ended up with the split families and the Uh, unwedded pregnancies. And what did government do? Government said, we'll give you more money yet if you have children from separate fathers, because we know there's no dad in the home. So what we're doing here, Scott, is just continued bad policy, and we can't continue to come back and beat up the taxpayers and force them to fund 
bad policy of the politicians past. Exactly. And, you know, the politicians in Detroit just don't get it. Uh, we have um, the mayor of Detroit has 38 staff members that make six figures. They just gave a $285 million uh, uh, assistance to build a hockey stadium to a family that owns the Detroit Red Wings. That's perfectly capable of building that hockey stadium themselves. And we have a Detroit City Councilman that was just arrested for uh, drugs in his, his back seat of his car after leaving us the strip club. All of those things just happened this year since January. So our point is the political culture, the political leadership, they don't get it. And we're enabling bad behavior by continuing to bail them out. And, uh, you know, things have to change. And, and uh, we, we have to get tough with cities like this and with local political leadership that continues to engage in this bad behavior. That's why we're thankful you're there. Listeners, viewers, you want more information, you go for americansforprosperity.org slash Michigan. If you're in another state, find the Americans for Prosperity in your neighborhood. Get active. Send them whatever you need to get involved and, 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 and help them make a difference because they're helping you save money. Scott, thanks for joining me today. Great. Thank you. And Mark Lucas is doing a great job in Iowa. Yes, he is. We like Mark Lucas, Andrew Klein. So the folks here are doing a great job. Um, we are out of time. I've, I've almost gone over my time. I think I probably have gone over my time. We've got, we've got a great show for you. You can find it at Tamara Scott Live on YouTube. Uh, you can find the, the archive. So stay encouraged and never be complacent.